Hi, everyone. This is Dr. Nicole Quinn, and I'm here with Dr. Arun Sharma, co-host of the Stem Cell Podcast. Welcome to the Lab Coats and Life Podcast, where we help scientists thrive. The Lab Coats and Life Podcast is brought to you by Stem Cell Technologies, a global biotechnology company supporting life sciences research and fostering communication and collaboration in science. If you enjoy the Lab Coats and Life Podcast, rate us and leave a review. You can also suggest ideas or recommend guests for new episodes. Today, we have Dr. Reka Iyer from the New York Stem Cell Foundation on the podcast to talk about her work in diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging in science. Reka is a fellow Canadian. She did her Bachelor of Science in Bioinformatics and Biology at the University of Waterloo and her PhD in Molecular Genetics at Heidelberg University. In 2018, she joined the New York Stem Cell Foundation, where she is currently the Vice President of Scientific Outreach, Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Belonging. Arun and I, along with Dr. Daylon James, co-host of the Stem Cell Podcast, recently had the pleasure of working with Reka when she took part in a panel discussion with the Stem Cell Podcast in front of a live studio audience at the NICEF headquarters in Manhattan. We knew that we wanted to spend more time with Reka digging deeper into and learning more from her experience and expertise in the topic of diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging in STEM. But before we get to that... Are you enjoying listening to the Lab Coats and Life podcast? Are there other soft skills, topics, or questions about your life in a lab coat that you'd like to learn more about? Visit www.stemcell.com slash suggest topics to tell us what you're passionate about, and we will endeavor to cover it via Stem Cell Technologies mentorship resources. Welcome, Reka, to Lab Coats and Life. We're so happy to see you again. Thank you so much for having me, uh, Nicole and Art. It's really a pleasure to chat with both of you um, again and, you know, kind of build on that really fun conversation we had at NYSIF, uh back in August now, I think it was, how time flies. We also saw each other when we did a stem cell podcast event um, with Blue Rock Therapeutics in New York. And I remember joking then we had we had seen each other every three months because we saw each other in June at the ISSCR. And I think we're about three months out from that. So we're on track. It's great. We've got to make this a quarterly thing. Yeah, I love it. Great to chat with you again, Rika. Good to see you. I mean, we, like Nicole said, we got to know you and the NYSEF team last summer at our in-person event in New York City. And I'm I'm always blown away. I was blown away by what I saw at NYSEF, all that automated cell culture, the amazing science that you and the team are doing. But, you know, NYSEF in part through your leadership is, is leading the charge and not just the science side of things, but also outside of science, right? Including building this really strong culture of diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging, or DEIB, at this cutting-edge stem cell institute that you have in New York City. So actually, before we even dive deeper into the DEIB side of things, could you just give a an overview of what NYSIF is all about, since folks on this podcast may not have listened to our other show? Um, so if you could just overview what NYSIF is all about and what its goals are, both scientifically and and not before we actually dive into the DEIB side of things. Yeah, absolutely. And first of all, how dare you not all have listened to our, our other <laughs> podcast? I mean, my goodness, I can't believe it. But um, no, I'm happy to introduce NYSEF. Uh, we're a bit of a unique kind of organization, and that's what kind of makes it really fun to work here. But we're the New York Stem Cell Foundation. Uh, we're both a foundation and a research institute. Um, which means the fun sort of never stops. So we, um, you know, we our mission uh, as a nonprofit and independent research institute is to accelerate treatments and cures for the major diseases of our time using the power of stem cell research. And so we, you know, we accomplish that mission in three major ways. Um, the one, the central piece of that is the research institute, which, you know, we we, we had the uh, pleasure to host you and uh, so many others in the community at um, last year. And the research institute really centers around uh, technology development um, and, you know, developing, enabling technologies for the entire stem cell community. Um, all of those fun robots that you mentioned are in are a, you know, a big part of that. And just being able to do stem cell research at scale at, with the reproducibility that, you know, we know is lacking um, so much when we go uh, from sort of lab to lab. Um, and to be able to, yeah, to look at the differences between patients with a certain disease, to look at inter-individual differences and make sure those are accounted for in our research as we're trying to both understand and develop better treatments um, for, uh, for these diseases. Um, alongside that technology, we have a lot of dedicated research teams who are working 
on uh, on areas like uh, Alzheimer's, like multiple sclerosis, like uh, diabetes, like Parkinson's, like um, ovarian cancer, and uh, you know they're very kind of much more integrated and sort of uh, uh, collaborative than what you'll see in a typical sort of academic environment, which um, makes it really cool that, you know, everybody's kind of working with the biologists next to the engineers, next to the software developers, next to the data scientists, and, you know, just trying to come together to really accelerate and do things that you can't necessarily do in a typical uh, sort of academic or even biotech um, environment. Um, you know, the goal of, of all of that is to to sort of serve as that bridge between academia and biotech, to bridge the knowledge to sort of translation and and see what we can do to address those gaps as kind of a nimble uh, nonprofit. Um, the other two major areas that we work in, um, one is through community building. Um, we have a, a global innovator community of over 200 scientists that we've built up uh, through our grant making programs for early career scientists in uh, stem cell research and neuroscience. So these are really incredible scientists scientists at the at the sort of edge of the field you guys have had tons of them on your on your podcast um you know folks like Paula Arlotta and Fang Zhang and uh, Ed Boyden and uh, so many more who have really transformed the way that we we do um our research and the third piece of it is education and outreach um and so that you know underneath that we have our annual conference that we host on translational stem cell research coming up this October 22nd and 23rd at Rockefeller, mark your calendars. Um, but we also do a lot of student and teacher education, um, programming for the lay public, um, you know, really just trying to get the excitement of science to all audiences that we possibly can. And I would say, you know, our, our DEI work um, kind of bridges across all of these activities. And, you know, obviously we'll we'll get into how, how that uh, happens. But that's sort of nice up in a nutshell. Yeah, that was a solid recap. And as somebody who's spent forever in just traditional academic institutes, it was just cool to experience the vibe. I just felt like there was so much energy at NYSA of this open door policy, everybody's just milling about, you know, no, no barriers or anything like that. That was really cool to see. So when it comes to your specific role as vice president of scientific outreach and DIB, you know. What do you do on a daily basis? What's life in the, what's your life like on a daily basis? Oh my gosh. How do I answer that one? Um, like, you know, I mean, Nicole hinted at this, this is a really, you know, um, broad and multifaceted role, but it's, uh, gosh, it's such a blast. So, you know, that in, entails everything from, I guess, let's say maybe four major areas. Um, one is, uh, you know, the science communications and, uh, you know, um, kind of getting our message out there to all of the audiences that matter. That means our fellow scientists. Um, that means, you know, the uh, the general public, you know, students, teachers, funders, um, all of the above, and just, you know, translating our science into uh, language that's both appealing and accessible to, uh, to all of these audiences in our print and digital uh, platforms. Um, another piece of it is event programming. So, you know, I work with um, really great team here to sort of figure out, okay, what kind of topics do we want to focus our events on? What kinds of speakers do we want to highlight? What kinds of questions can we ask? Um, how do we, you know, how do we do that? Again, you know, tailored to uh, to these different audiences, including like the uh, the conference that, you know, we really get so many great people from this community at every year. Um, and then uh, another area is in grant funding, you know, kind of raising grant funding for our intramural research uh, institute, um, where you know, we have we have uh, our kind of traditional PIs who are running their research teams, and we're, you know, much like uh, any other academic lab, we're applying for NIH grants, for uh, other foundation grants, um, all kinds of things, collaborating with um, with people all over the world um, to to facilitate those um, you know those projects and those those funding chances, um, and then, you know, the. Uh, on the flip side of the grants is that I also, you know, work on our extramural grant making, which is, um, you know, through our fellowship and investigator programs for early career scientists. So, you know, I provide kind of scientific guidance and DIB related guidance to make sure that we're just, you know, we're doing the best that we can in selecting um, the, you know, the the rising stars that we want to support in the field who we think are really going to going to make a difference and, you know, adding a DEI lens, which we can we can talk about. 
um, has been a really fun and rewarding um, part of that. And then, you know, the fourth major major aspect is, of course, the the DEI work and figuring out how can we embed that, embed that um, across the entire organization. And um, so that's sort of, you know, that's the high level view when it comes to the day to day and what's a day in the life. It depends on the day. Um, it's really, you know, I can be spending my entire day on one of these things. I can, you know, most often I'm bouncing back and forth, you know, with grant deadlines, things will change dramatically with events around the corner, things will change dramatically. So, you know, it, it requires a real diversity of tasks, um, no pun intended, but it's something I, I really enjoy. And, uh, you know, the, the kind of core of all of it to me that brings it together is communicating about our science and, you know, connecting with our community. And that's just, that's what inspires me about uh, about this work, both at NYSIF and more broadly. Amazing. I want to, I want to back up. I mean, there's so many questions I have in there about NYSEF and about the work you do, but I think it'd be, it'd be nice to back up and find out, you know, what led you here? Because I, I mentioned your education and obviously you trained as a lab, you know, a research scientist and mm -hmm. somewhere along the line, you made a pivot. Um, and I, I'm interested to hear what that was like and why. Yeah, I, I mean, so yes, I, I trained in genomics and, uh, you know, that was another very sort of technology driven field. And, you know, I started getting into research at the time of the Human Genome Project uh, being published. So, you know, y'all can do your estimates on the <laughs> on the timing there, but uh, that was such an exciting time to get into research. And, uh, you know, I was always drawn to research for the, uh, for the impact that it could have on really understanding why certain people get diseases and people, other people don't, how we can treat them better. And in my mind, when I got into it, genetics was the answer to that. It's like, you know, those individual variations are, uh, are what's responsible. And, you know, so I, I as I went through my career, um, scientifically, I, I, I gravitated towards stem cells because, you know, the more time you spend in genetics and genomics, the more you realize that that's not the whole story, actually. <laughs> you don't necessarily know just because you know what those variants are, how they're impacting the cell and the biology um, of an individual. And so stem cells are kind of that that scaffold that was that that you're you're sort of needing to interpret the genetic um, data. And then in terms of the communications aspect of things, you know, I was I did my PhD in Germany, as you pointed out, and, um, you know, I ended up kind of getting like uh, recruited into um, uh, editing uh, tasks for my lab because I was the only native English speaker. And people would be like, can you just can you fix my English in this manuscript and in this grant and what have you? And I in the process of doing that, I realized I really enjoyed that aspect of just telling a story of interpreting data, of building a narrative of like, what what does this mean? Um, for our field and for for the studies that can come next. And uh, so I, you know, ended up like very long story short, but sort of just building, building a career around that because, um, you know, I think we all, we can all appreciate that science needs good communication, um, that we, we encounter disastrous effects when, um, when there isn't that good communication. I think the, uh, the pandemic has laid that bare for all of us, um, the consequences of when it's not done um, correctly. So it, it's, it, I, I sort of felt that was a calling, that there need to be more scientists who understand the science, who are, who are getting the word out there and can do so in a responsible way, in an accurate way, and hopefully an engaging way too, that, um, you know, spreads that, that excitement and gets everyone on board who needs to be on board. Amazing. So, so what led you into this current role at, at, at NICEF? And maybe wrapped up in that answer will be the answer to this question, which is, what are some of the things that the the New York Stem Cell Foundation is doing um, towards diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging? And I'm specifically interested in in that B, that belonging um, sort of tag mm -hmm. on there. I don't see that. I haven't seen it anywhere else. Um, mm. and I don't know if that was intentional, a NICEF thing, or if there's a story in there. I don't know. I've kind of asked you three questions there, but I'm sure, you, <laughs> I'm sure you, you're a communicator. Can... You can tell the story, right? <laughs> right? Let's see if I can parse that apart. So <laughs> what led me to NICEF? So the first, um, you know, that aspect of it, like Ara and I spent all, you know, my whole life in academia um, and academic research. And you know, I, I, I absolutely loved it. It's really great to be at that edge of discovery and everything. Um, but, you know, I, I started to feel like in my science communication career path, 
that there isn't, you know, there isn't a whole lot of navigation you can do. There's, you know, specific kinds of roles you can fill that people will kind of make exceptions and fill for you. I feel like that's maybe changing a little bit since I was in academia, but, you know, by and large, it was, it was pretty hard to figure out, okay, what can I do? How can I grow? And I was always a team of one. So I couldn't, you know, there's only so many hours in the day, um, even as an academic. Uh, so, you know, um, I was I was looking further afield to see like, okay, how can I do something that's going to be even more impactful? Um, and again, you know, further along that pipeline of, of translation, because that was something that, um, you know, I was passionate about. So, you know, and just kind of looking around, I, I encountered NICEF. Um, I had you know, a, a former classmate of mine from my PhD who was who was working here. So he, you know, he told me all about it and it sounded really great. I, you know, I came here, got to visit, love the nonprofit um, sort of environment, how passionate everyone was, that sort of hybrid kind of identity that we have as both a grant maker and a grant um, sort of receiver, both, re you know, the research aspect. So you can be kind of really close to cutting edge research. And the technology, right? Like I mentioned, you know, my background being in genomics and seeing what the Genome Project did for that field, um, you know, I felt like the same kind of thing was starting to happen in stem cell uh, research, um, you know, a little bit later than genomics, but we're very much, you know, in that same trajectory now where you're seeing it just transform everything. And that's because of you know, the Yamanaka factors and then, you know, everybody building on that to be able to look at all these different cell types. And gosh, it was just so exciting um, to learn about that. So I was like, okay, I could see myself here. Um, let's see, your second or third question, it was around like DEI and how we're integrating that. Was that right? Yeah, I, I, it's maybe a related question, but maybe we can dig more to the the DE, DE and I and B, um, and where the New York Stem Cell Foundation fits, but also just your own, you know, your own path towards working in this space. Yeah, I th you know, it, the DEI work was not something I necessarily envisioned myself doing when I was in academia, or even to be frank, even knew what it was. Um, I think, you know, in 2020, uh, we, like so many other organizations, um, were going through sort of a reckoning of like, okay, well, what are we going to do about this? Um, there's certainly more that we could be doing. Um, not to say that NICEF had been, you know, totally out of the game, but prior to my uh, joining, you know, Susan uh, Solomon, our, our founding CEO, um, she had started the NICEF Initiative on Women in Science and Engineering. Um, and that was, you know, that's something I can talk about some more, but that was really around like, you know, how can we advance gender equity in the field and make sure that women are getting access to opportunities the same way um, that the sort of everyone is. Um, but in 2020 was when I got pulled into it. Um, you know, I think it was sort of a, a, a byproduct of all the communications work that I do and, you know, both sort of internally and externally. And, um, you know, as we were sort of trying to understand what to do as an organization, trying to see where we could have the biggest impact. You know, one of the hardest things with DEI work is, is that there's, you know, there's so much that needs to be done. We have so far to go in so many ways. You obviously can't boil the ocean. So, you know, especially as a small organization, we're only 120 people. It's really about figuring out what can you do that has the most impact? What can you do that's intentional, that's aligned with your mission? Um, and, uh, you know, in conversations with Susan, she just kind of said like, hey, why don't you, you know, why don't you do this? And the no good deed goes unpunished was when I was kind of coming up with suggestions for what we could be doing. Um, she said, why don't you take this on as, uh, you know, as part of your role? I think you'd be, you know, really great about it, really thoughtful for it, um, you know, hopefully having good judgment <laughs> about it, which I, I, I hope I still do. But, um, you know, that, that was, or that was around kind of internal culture building, some of the external communications and events, which I was already embedded in. And so it's like, you know, okay, how can we use um, what we call that convening authority that we have at NICEF um, to spotlight some of these issues, draw attention to them, um, try to come up with things that we can do together again, you know, not being able to boil the ocean alone, but what can we do with this amazing community um, to, to kind of start to right some of these wrongs, just to kind of start to level the playing field. Um, because, you know, the way that Susan put it that I really, that really, really resonated with me and still does is, is that if we're going to achieve our mission, if we're going to deliver on our mission of accelerating treatments and cures, we need all of the brightest minds in the field. 
to have the opportunity to contribute and the opportunity to succeed. And that's simply not going to be possible unless we actually are able to level the playing field and, you know, in, integrate that that equity of access uh, to folks that, you know, we, we like to say science is a meritocracy, but that's not the case. Um, and we, we, we have a ways to go before we make it so. Yeah, you talked about, um, you know, how you guys are really leading the charge in this sort of area. One of these, even though you're a relatively small institute, you've really taken DIB to the forefront and really have made this a point of emphasis at NYSIF. And what are some, I guess, major successes that you like to point to when it comes to uh, DEIB that you think NYSIF has really pioneered and really pushed forward? And and what do you think are, you know, what, what really makes you excited about the things you've accomplished over the last couple of years or so? Um, great question. I, I want to preface that by saying, I you know, in this work, you kind of always wish you could be doing more. So that's kind of a hard question to answer because I, you know, I, I, I focus so much on what we could be doing. But I, I guess, okay, yes, there are some things I can say for that. Um, you know, I mentioned the initiative on women in science and engineering that Susan launched in around, uh, I think it was 2011 or 2012, you know, way before my time. Um, and, you know, the, what she did was kind of convene some really, uh, some of the leaders in the field to think about what can we do to make institutions advance gender equity, to level the playing field, um, you know, for for women. And so they, you know, they came up with, Seven actionable strategies, um, and this was published in a in a cell stem cell paper in uh, in uh, twenty fourteen, I think it was twenty fifteen, um, where these are low cost or no cost strategies that institutions can adopt, um, you know, and that and that they're really you know something actionable. So some, you know, some examples are uh, you know extra hands awards for um, for people who are you know having. Um, uh, you know, changes in their life or families or that sort of thing to to be able to um, to hire additional additional help when um, you know when they become a primary caregiver for uh, someone or the other. Um, you know, that's that's a little bit of cost. It's uh, you know, there's recommendations and ways to get around that. Um, there's also things around psychological and cultural change. Um, you know, making sure that you're recruiting gender balance review committees and speaker selection committees, and that all sounds you know a little bit. Um, a little bit obvious now, but it it was not at all the case at the time that this was put out. People were not doing this, um, right? And one of the biggest things that came out of that that we still continue today is an institutional report card for gender equality. And um, so we we used our you know sort of carrot as a as a grant maker to gather this kind of data um, as benchmarking data for the entire field to understand what is the state of gender equity. Um, across the pipeline and so that we can understand when certain interventions are made, what kind of impact they're having. And again, really go towards those most impactful uh, interventions possible. And so this institutional report card is something that we implemented right away in our extramural grant making programs. We require every applicant um, to fill this out. So their department has to submit information about um, the, the sort of breakdown of uh, gender balance throughout the academic pipeline from students all the way to, you know, the tenured professors on decision making committees, um, and so on. And so we've been, you know, we've been collecting a lot of that data, we, we published it um, a few years ago, uh, you know, the, our first data set from over 500 institutions um, in, uh, you know, nearly 40 countries, and found, you know, unfortunately, not great news um, that, you know, it was, there was no real improvement over a four year span um, that, you know, there's this, this leaky pipeline that is often referred to what was actually, you know, being contested at the time, whether that was actually really a thing. It's very much a thing. We have solid, beautifully, horribly uh, linear data that shows the drop off of, uh, of women at every stage um, in, in the academic pipeline. As you, as you advance, we saw that, you know, the total uh, lack of women at, in uh, decision-making roles. So of course, you know, that's one, one kind of leads to another. Um, and we, you know, we also survey for, you know, uh, uh, policies that institutions have in place to, uh, to be able to, uh, to gather, um, uh, to uh, sort of uh, combat these, um, these disparities and so on. And so we did see, you know, at the, at the end of that period, we did start to see some institutions take on some policies, including some of the ones that we had advocated for in these seven actionable um, strategies. 
Um, so I guess one success that came out of that, aside from, you know, really cool data slash really terrible data that we can, you know, show <laughs> show as a, as a demonstration of the state of things, is that at the very beginning when this was happening, the departments didn't even know where to find this data. And they, they didn't want to provide it, a lot of them. Um, but, you know, we kind of said, well, you can't apply. You just you're not going to be eligible for the grant if you don't submit this data. Of course, we don't judge anybody um, based on the data because nobody would get the grant because all of the data is pretty terrible. Um, but we just say you have to have it for your application to be complete. So we were, you know, uh, we got a lot of pushback at the beginning because, yeah, people just didn't want to didn't want to bother getting the data or didn't want to share the data with us. Um, and now, you know, it is. It is um, something that's become pretty standard because we've had it around for so long. And I've, you know, I just got an email from one of our investigators the other day saying that, you know, because of this, they actually have started tracking this data more regularly themselves and are using it, um, you know, to kind of benchmark where they are as a department. And, you know, we hear a lot of stories like that. So I would I would consider that to be, you know, pretty great achievement um, in, in what, what the IWAS initiative has done for the field, and we're continuing to analyze that data. Um, hopefully, we'll see an improvement, um, you know, over the past few years, although we had a pandemic that was obviously not great for women in science, but, um, you know, let's see. So I think I might know where some of these women are going. So at Stem Cell, we have 56% uh, female population, which is super awesome, and we're very proud of it. Um, and we provide a great place to work for people of all different backgrounds, because there's you know, benefits and work-life balance and and some of the things that are not offered uh, in academia. Um, but I think on the flip side, um, you know, the reason we have so many women coming to stem cell is because of some of the um, inaccessibility within the academic world. And there's a lot of opportunity to do great work without some of those barriers in place that are that are there in academia. You know, that's an excellent point. And I mean, yeah, definitely kudos to um, to you guys on on that, on those numbers. And I think that's something that we're seeing a lot of, you know, uh, of course, beyond women as well. And I, I think a lot of what we're seeing with the postdoc crisis, this sort of exodus of uh, of postdocs from academia is is because of these environments that are being, you know, that are just unsustainable for people. And, you know, people are rightfully fed up with this with this position where you're you're exploited you're paid the worst possible salary you can pay a phd educated person and you're in this horribly toxic environment where you you're just you know expected to to shut up and take it because that's what you need to get to the next step in your career and no wonder that a lot of these postdocs are going to uh to biotech to you know all kinds of other other areas you know one other aspect of the industry thing that I think is so interesting um, that I've learned as we've gone through this work is that industry has been so much better at addressing um, DEI in a, in a systematic way than, uh, than academia has. And that's, it, it goes to sort of, uh, and you can tell me, you know, your experiences with this, Nicole, but what I understand is, is that it's, it goes more towards the bottom line, that there's so much literature out there now showing, and we, you know, we, we need more of this literature in academia, but at least at, in the corporate world, there's a lot of literature showing that diversity uh, leads to innovation and that, you know, equitable environments lead to innovation. And so if you want innovation, you want your bottom line, your profit, it's just not going to happen unless you really address this. And so, you know, the the bar has moved a lot um, higher in uh, industry, um, and we have we have some catching up to do in uh, you know sort of the academic uh, sector where we kind of think, oh, we're not about the bottom line; we're just about knowledge and discovery, and it's already a meritocracy because we're also objective as scientists, and we sort of have the wool pulled over our eyes on that, and a lot of this stuff is allowed to um, to persist, unfortunately. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, diversity of thought, diversity of life experience, all of those things yes, lead to every dimension. Yeah, all of it leads to, you know, diversity of ingenuity and different business practices and the ability to navigate, you know, the changing world and learn to work with yes. different people in different <laughs> sectors. Yeah, absolutely. It it is there it does impact the bottom line, but it also makes it a, a much it makes it a wonderful place to work. So 
That for sure. But it's like, you know, sometimes when you're trying to bring people along, it's like, hey, forget about it. You know, if you agree with this as like a moral thing to do, right? Because the reality is you're not going to convince everybody of that. That's sort of the the harsh reality of the world. But if it's, you know, if, even if you're just being entirely pragmatic, you're like, hey, I just want to get things done on like the lowest budget possible and the fastest time possible. This is how you do it. Yep. Yep. You need people who speak different languages. You know, you need all of those different uh, different elements of of diversity that, that factor in. Yeah, no, absolutely. And kind of going off of that, you know, we talk about diversity of people, diversity of thought, and this is a, an inherently diverse field. I think stem cell biology is a pretty diverse field, at least when you think about the people in the field. We're in a relatively new field, a very international field, right? I mean, I've said this before on the, the stem cell podcast, one of my favorite things about the modern scientific world, which may have may or may not have been the case decades ago, is, you know, just meeting scientists from anywhere and everywhere at these big scientific conferences, like the ISSCR annual meeting that's coming up, for example. I mean, every time I go to these meetings, I'm just blown away, blown away really by the conversations I have with these stem cell biologists from around the world, every walk of life, every background. But, you know, while there are scientists everywhere and super talented scientists everywhere, they don't always have the same opportunities to shine, right? I mean, this is it's reflected in a lot of different ways because, you know, resources are skewed. I mean, we have a, that's no doubt in, in the academic side of things for sure. I mean, certain geographic hubs have established their reputations decades ago. You know, I used to be in Boston and it seems like everybody worked in Boston at some point, was affiliated with one of the major academic centers there and spun out of biotech, whatever. So, you know, the talent tends to be aggregated at these geographic hubs. And this ultimately, I think it manifests itself in a lot of different ways. You see the same institutions, research groups overrepresented in publications and grants that they get because they're the ultimately the ones with the influence and the resources to make this cutting edge science happen in a lot of times, right? And so that in itself can hurt diversity, even though we have people from everywhere, there's over-representation from certain geographic areas. So how do we actually solve that problem when it comes to diversity? How do we solve? <laughs> how do we solve things, Rekha? How do we solve things? <laughs> how do we solve it all? Yeah, I don't I mean, know. How, Gosh, how much like, time do you guys have? <laughs> yeah, but it's it's I think a real yeah. problem, definitely in academia. So we want like a more diverse group of people at leadership, in particular, that's just not associated or aggregated at these hubs, right? One hundred percent. So there's uh, there's so many interesting things that you you brought up there that you know we could talk about. I mean, there's the di difference between diversity as representation and then the EIB, which you know the the equity, inclusion, and belonging. So yes, we can fix the representation problem. Um, you know, we could we could uh, ram things into quotas and all of that, and uh, and then you know you would not at all fix the problem because. The entire problem is, again, that environment, that uh, those opportunities to succeed, those opportunities to thrive. And, you know, to go back to your question, so I don't forget it forever, Nicole, but the B has been really important for us because the belonging is that sense of feeling that arises um, when you are really in that uh, inclusive environment. And that's the ultimate goal of our DEI efforts is that we want that feeling of belonging to, uh, to, uh, to arise in everybody who's, you know, part of our institute, part of our community, because when people have that feeling, they are really able to be their best selves and to perform at the, at their highest level and to, you know, to advance the field again, if you're being very pragmatic about it. Um, so that's one thing, but another thing that, you know, to, to address your question more directly, Aaron, about like, um, you know, geographical diversity, this is something we think about a lot in our uh, extramural grant making. Um, and so, as you can imagine, um, you know, when you don't look at this, um, like in the first few years of, of our grant making, you do have, you know, a predominance of Boston uh, institutions coming up and uh, and getting these awards. That's sort of naturally what happens for all the reasons that you described um, so well. And so, you know, one of the geographical diversity is definitely one of the dimensions we look at very carefully in our in our grant making. But it's it's alongside all of these other kinds of dimensions of of, of gender diversity, of you know ancestral diversity, of scientific diversity, of um, you know, of just any kind of minoritization um, that 
that uh, scientists have had to go through um, that affects, again, their, their ability to thrive. And so that, you know, I'm, I'm answering many questions here. I'm going back to one thing that, you know, you had asked Aaron about our, our sort of achievements. And this is one of the things I'm most proud of since I got here, um, you know, working with this amazing team that we have on extramural grants making and, uh, you know, working with uh, Paula Arlotta, who's been um, an advisor for us. Um, we have changed the way that we do our, our review process in the last uh, few years to, to both um, number one, elevate um, minoritized scientists um, who had been minoritized in any sort of way, whether that's, again, due to gender, due to race, due to, um, you know, a geograph a geographical, you know, lack of access to resources due, due to whatever. I mean, we don't actually try to slice and dice it and put a lot of categories that you can check off um, because, you know, we, we kind of let, leave it as an open-ended statement um, in the application where you can self-identify as you know, part of any minoritized group in science and provide what what some funders are referring to as sort of a resilient statement, like, you know, talk about your identity to us and talk about how it's affected your career trajectory, if it's had, if it's led to any undue hardships for you. And we we have our reviewers um, pair that with the bio sketch when they're looking at track record so that when you're comparing, you know, one bio sketch to the other, you might say, well, you know, they have roughly, uh, you know, equally impactful uh, publications in science that they've done. But this person has gone through so much more to get where they are. Um, we had stories, you know, in in these statements of, you know, of domestic abuse, of uh, fleeing war torn countries, of, you know, you name it. And if you if you have a scientist who goes through that and comes out the other side, um, you know, just as successful as someone else, gosh, they're going to be so much more successful in the future, right? Because that track record is such a great predictor. So that's one aspect of what we've done. And the geography is wrapped up in there um, as well. And the other aspect is rewarding those who have gone out of their way to advance um, DEIB in uh, the research community in their own labs or institutes or, or communities through, you know, things like uh, joining their committees, um, doing non-mandatory self-education, um, taking on mentorship programs, educational programs to offer access to science education to communities that might not receive it otherwise. The list goes on and on and, you know, advocating for institutional policies that will that will change things. And and gosh, reading some of these um, these statements really was the highlight of my last couple of years and just seeing the incredible things that even postdocs are doing or somehow finding the time to do um, to, uh, to to change the field. And, you know, so we we're, we've implemented both of these things and, you know, along with implicit bias training of our reviewers and all kinds of things to make sure that what, what we're selecting at the end are those meritorious scientists, but that we're also, you know, um, updating our definition of what meritorious is. You're not meritorious because you've come from the pedigree of such and such. We're, we don't, you know, we don't talk about pedigrees anymore um, during review meetings. Uh, we say like, what is the science that this person has done? What is the impact that this person has had both as a scientist and as a community builder? And what what is, um, you know, what has this scientist had to undergo to get where they are? And let's let's stitch all of that into a picture of what merit and likelihood of future success looks like. And, we, you know, the greatest thing has been seeing how well our reviewers have have just sort of jumped on board. I was bracing myself for some pushback because this is like, you know, this is a different definition of what we traditionally view as success in science. And everybody was like, oh, this is great. You know, where they were just thrilled to uh, to get on board with it. And um, that's been, you know, just, a, I think, a, a success that I wanted to highlight. And we've been, you know, trying to, we've been talking to other funders regularly who are implementing pieces of this. I mean, certainly we weren't the first. A lot of these things have come from inspiration with with other funders. But um, so that's, you know, that's a long answer to, you know, sort of your question about uh, about geography. But it's, you know, it is it is part of like a, a sort of multifaceted way that we look at trying to, again, level that playing field and recognize talent from places that we're we're not looking with our traditional metrics in science. It's incredible. I, I it's so inspiring to know that you know you're making little differences that are going to add up to huge differences in terms of how funding and grants and recognition and reward um, is it happens within science. 
Uh, I want to go back a little bit to to what Arun was talking about with geography. I recently had the privilege of attending a, an immunology meeting, the International Union of Immunological Societies meeting, IUIS in Cape Town, South Africa, and um, with with our other podcast, the Immunology Podcast, and it was. I, I can't even describe the rewarding and humbling experience it was to attend a scientific meeting in Africa and mm. and the way it opened my eyes to how, you know, as as intentional and um, you know, good good intention as we are to to try to be inclusive and create a global scientific community, there are real logistical and of course economical barriers to providing um access and accessibility uh, accessibility and and uh, for inclusion for global scientists and there were scientists from many african countries um you know it, well countries all over the world but many lower economic countries who they were so so happy to attend a meeting and so thankful that we'd come because they mm-hmm. couldn't access the visas never mind the funds to come to conferences and meetings in Europe and in North America. Um, and this was just, it opened my eyes to, we have to do better as a scientific community to make our global scientists feel included and have access to these conversations and to um, to how we share science. And there were many, many people there who were avid listeners of our podcast because they said, this gives us, it makes us feel included. It makes us feel like we know a little bit more about what's going on in the world. And we don't always, they can't even always access journals. Um, mm-hmm. so I don't know if NICEF is doing anything here. It sounds like, you know, with, with some of the, um, uh, grant funding and, 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 um, evaluations, you are making sure that you're including stuff like that, but any comments on how to provide more global access to information on science? That's uh, such a great point, uh, Nicole and, um, Cape Town, which I happened to actually have visited last month um, as well. Um, what a what a humbling place to to learn about DEI and uh, you know and kind of the uh, the sort of progress that we still have yet to make. Um, it's uh, you know certainly been a, a center of those lessons and that and that reckoning that that we're that we're going through. And it's you know it's it was horrifying to me to see some of the uh, the things that were in place within our lifetime yeah you know, so recently just like so in, recently. in the 90s that this stuff was happening and gosh it was um but you know I I think I think that's a really important point to raise I can't you know through our our community um we we are trying to fund globally of course but I I can't say that we've you know done a done a great job of like fully global geographical diversification as much as we'd want to have. Um, you know, we certainly increased our outreach to, uh, to you know, underrepresented regions of the world in our applicants and award portfolios. Um, you know, we've we've tried, but I, I can't say that it's, you know, it's translated into, you know, new awards to Africa as much as I would, I would love to be able to, uh, to see that happen sometime. So, you know, uh, I, this is where us as a small organization becomes a becomes a a, a kind of um, a limiting and frustrating thing for us. You know, we wish we could have the voice and the arm to reach that far and and to get people to uh, to know us and to to apply and to for us to be able to impact them. But you know, I think I think other organizations like ISSCR are doing a really great job in this and you know amping up their um, you know, their, their events and their, uh, you know, kind of outreach in, in those parts of the world. And we're, we're happy to partner and, you know, provide whatever, whatever additional, you know, knowledge or support that we possibly can, um, you know, for those, I think that's where, you know, partnerships really come in because we've, we've got to work together on these kinds of things. Partnerships, collaboration, awareness, and then some of the things you yeah. mentioned before, setting, setting examples and providing frameworks and, and, you know, toolkits. You talk about, you know, needing to make changes, right? That's one of the themes of this show is that we've come a long way, but we still have a long way to go. Um, Changes are tough to make a lot of times, especially in academia, which is, you know, there's a lot of inertia in academia. Everybody kind of knows that. Indeed. Grand cultural changes that you want to make, right? Even at industrial institutions, the bigger the institution, the more inertia there is. I mean, maybe it's bureaucracy, maybe it's inertia, whatever, but we've all seen this play out, right? I mean, mm-hmm. with the within like 
any number of the academic institutions that I've been at with multiple departments, you have certainly still smaller subgroups in which change is more feasible, right? Individual research groups, which can be maybe a little bit more nimble when it comes to changing culture, for example. And I mean, I'm a brand new PI, it's, that's no secret. Um, but I, I think about culture a lot because especially for a yeah. new lab, um, you know, any small cultural change that you make from the top, it can have just a dramatic impact immediately because it's such a small, small institution, small, small group, right? Um, mm -hmm. So for the new PIs out there, I'm going to put you on the spot. Um, <laughs> for some of the, the new PIs out there who are trying to set up their culture in the right way, what are some like tangible action items that they could they could have mm. or points of emphasis that those PIs or group leaders can, you know, can do? What are these some things that they can do to promote, say, DEIB right off the bat in their their new lab? That's such a great question. Um, it's such an important one. I think, you know, there's there's a few things that come to mind. Um, one is you know, starting out by saying that this is an important value in the lab. And, you know, a lot of people will will point to that as virtue signaling. But I, I think there is a certain amount of signaling that is actually valuable for advancing the culture, um, you know, coming out and staying and saying it, putting a, a statement on your your lab website can help to sort of at least set the tone as folks are are coming in. I think, you know, when you talk about that sort of uh, uh, inertia and like kind of the um, the way that academic culture is stuck, one of the ways that I found that it's stuck that's really not conducive to um, to DEIB is this this concept of PI as God, and like uh, you know, there's sort of the the God that uh, comes down from on high and uh, tells you what to do, and that's sort of that, and <laughs> you've just got to do it, and you'll never know why, you'll never know. Um, you know, you you don't get to sort of uh, discuss it or understand where the you know the rationale is coming from. So I think one of the the best things that a new PI could do um, would be to sort of try to break down those barriers and just be as transparent as possible. Like you know, hey, these are some of the struggles that we have. Hey, here, this is why I need you to spend more time writing this grant than I need you to spend on, you know, going to this conference right now because we're we're actually in a funding crunch and I'm getting some pressure from my department head on that. You know, I think a lot of PIs are just so afraid to be vulnerable and to be open and honest with their um with their their students and postdocs and what have you, but I think, you know, a lot of the culture and the uh the kind of that feeling of belonging to be part of the lab and the decision making and the uh you know the activities that go on wherever wherever possible to give folks a chance at that and to give them insight into why you're doing things the way that they are and you know even apologizing if you make a mistake um i i actually didn't see a ton of that in that continuum um and so the first time i saw you know somebody who was in a position of authority apologize to me for something i was kind of blown away i was like oh i thought you weren't even supposed to do that you know, um, never, never admit a fault or a weakness. That's, that's, uh, you know, but I think that's, that's the part of the culture that we just need to do away with. I mean, and there's, there's tons of literature out there showing that, you know, that, that vulnerability, that transparency, um, these are positive leadership qualities that will, again, like, you know, if you're just being pragmatic about it, um, will will lead to better results um, from your team, but of course will also engender those feelings of uh, of inclusion and belonging that you want your lab um, to be. So, you know, giving folks a chance to uh, to um, speak up. Um, I know some some great PIs in the field who have done lab surveys. Um, Leslie Vosshall, um, who's a fantastic uh, scientist at Rockefeller and now is at HHMI as well as the um, in, in leadership there, uh, she put out a sort of template lab survey that you can you can Google and, uh, you know, has a lot of those questions where, you know, the people can give feedback um, to the PI. Um, and so some of the good initiatives I've seen and which we highlighted actually at our at our, uh, our, our uh, community retreat last year um, were around, you know, OK, how can you implement this kind of a climate survey? Um, can you actually be willing to. <laughs> to read the results, to acknowledge the results, and to share the results with your lab to whatever extent you feel comfortable, and to come up with some actions that you can, um, you know, that you can work on as a lab, even to say like, okay, what are 
what are some ways that we can address concern X? Um, I suggest this. What do you all think? You know, really making that a sort of um, bi-directional open dialogue uh, kind of culture, I think, can can really help. And, uh, you know, again, is something that's really lacking. We do a lot of surveys and, you know, um, those kinds of things in the, you know, in the biotech and nonprofit sectors even. But I think that's the kind of thing that was lacking in, in academia, at least in my experience. Mm -hmm. That's another area you, you spoke earlier about how uh, in industry there are more frameworks and more policies and just more structure around um, and, and which leads to a different culture, I think, around DEI and B. And um, mm -hmm. that is one thing that we do a lot of at, at Stem Cell is internal 360 reviews. There's an engagement survey that's actually annual and it's happening right now um, that that asks a lot of um, anonymous questions. So there's not a, a fear of, you know, retribution or anything like that. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's excellent because then you can start to have those conversations. And, you know, we talked earlier about building frameworks, giving people tools, perpetuating certain practices. And yeah, if you start at the lab level, like Arun said, and build a culture in your lab, you can spread it to the department and spread it to the, you know, ultimately the institution and maybe really start to make some changes in that, to that, um, the inertia. That, that Absolutely. And I think there's a reticence to take on some of those things in academia because it's like, oh, but the freedom of academia, we don't need to do these like structured, like bureaucratic performance reviews and those kinds of things. And, you know, we want it to be free and knowledge and, and, and all of that, but, you know, a, a teeny little bit of structure and a teeny bit of these sorts of things can, can go a long way. Um, in a, in a place like academia. The, the other thing I'll say is that I think the traditional kind of culture, um, is that, you know, I, PIs often are just sort of focused on the results. Like what's the data? Show me the data. Show me the data. Okay. If you haven't done the data, then do more of the data. And we'll talk about, you know, your, your presence in this lab is solely linked to your data. Um, but I think we're, you know, the culture is starting to shift a little bit. Certainly a lot of, a lot of PIs are, are starting to change that is like, you know, show you're interested in the well-being of your, of the human beings who work in your lab to acknowledge that they are, you know, human beings who are going through their own things and, you know, check on how they are. Um, and that even just feeling like your PI cares about those things, gosh, that can go a really long way to making you feel okay every day and like that you can show up as your true self yeah absolutely all right we're we're i would really want to switch gears because there's another side of um of diversity equity inclusion and belonging in science uh, specifically in cell biology and medicine mm -hmm. that we we haven't talked about yet and i think we need to talk about which is which is diversity of patients and research and cell lines um and you hosted I you, know, you spoke about your uh, annual NICEF conference that uh, happens in October, and I had the privilege of attending this year. And you chaired a panel discussion, Reka, that had me on the edge of my seat and chills. Um, it was just, you know, I'd heard you speak before, so I, I wasn't expecting to be blown away by this. Because not that I didn't think you were going to say anything profound, but I thought, oh, I'm probably going to hear what I heard Reka speak of before. And this was different and it was just so powerful. And, and specifically, you had a speaker named Crystal Tsosi, so um, mm -hmm. correct me if I didn't get that right, who is a PhD um, and she's an indigenous geneticist, bioethicist and an assistant professor. And um, and she spoke about, um, you know, representation in cell lines and in patient samples. And I'm interested to hear your perspective. And I know Arun has some questions specifically about what NICEP is doing here. So um, I, maybe you can dig into that a little bit, that issue and what you know about it. Yeah. Um, I mean, thank you for your words about that that discussion. It was, um, you know, it was just a, a really engaging one for me as well, even kind of knowing the people going into it. I think it just came together in such a um, such an inspiring way. Um, you know, we also had a patient advocate on there who who really, you know, reminded us of what we need to be reminded of, um, you know, behind all of these cell lines and this data that we generate, there are human beings, again, you know, like just just like in the workforce, but you know, in our in our data, these are people behind these samples. Um, they have their own journeys. And, you know, it is sort of our responsibility to uh, to be aware of that as scientists, but kind of more generally, what I'll just say is that, um, you know, uh, all of us are working towards 
um, medical breakthroughs and, you know, the mortality rate has changed, um, has improved for so many of these, these major diseases, but the disparity, um, in, 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 uh, racial health, uh, like the racial disparities in health outcomes has, has widened, has increased over time for so many of these diseases. And so, you know, we're, we're only doing better at saving the lives of the subset of people. And that is obviously not what, you know, that does not fulfill any of the missions that we're, that we're on. And so this is why NICEF has taken this really seriously. Again, it's mission aligned. We're talking about accelerating uh, treatments and cures for the major diseases of our time for everybody who has those diseases, not just the people who happen to have been overrepresented um, in our research to date. And so you know, the technology that we've talked about, the NICEF Global Stem Cell Array, this robotic system that can generate um, IPSC lines at scale. Um, part of that, you know, the vision that Susan had when building that um, and calling it the Global Stem Cell Array was that it would represent the global diversity of, uh, of the human population in stem cell lines and that we'd be able to do disease research with an inclusive lens so that even from the very get-go when you're trying to understand what is a neuron do, that you know you have you have a an inclusive definition of that, and so you know the understanding that we have of what a neuron does, or any of those fundamental biology questions, all the way to like what is Alzheimer's, all the way to what is the best treatment for diabetes, those are all incredibly biased in the answers that we have to them um, that have only really applied to white Europeans who have been the majority of research participants for a wide variety of reasons that we need to understand if we're going to uh, to rectify that problem. And so, you know, what NICEF is doing, uh, we built the technology, the technology is there and ready to go. We can throw, you know, we can do hundreds of lines at a time. Um, what's lacking is the funding. Everybody agrees it's a problem, but uh, nobody wants to fund it. Um, so that's one thing we're working on. Another thing that we're working on is is those partnerships and those, those uh, you know, kind of awareness building engagement kind of campaigns, because like I said, we have a lot of sort of competencies that we need to build in the scientific community. We have a lot of um, trust that we need to rebuild with these minoritized communities, because the reality is that they are very justifiably hesitant to participate in research. Um, Crystal highlighted this so beautifully on behalf of the indigenous community that, you know, why would they want to give up their data to um, to a project um, where somebody else is going to benefit before they will? Why should they? They, they want data sovereignty um, because obviously they haven't had land sovereignty. We, we took that from them. Um, so, you know, these are the kinds of things that we need to be mindful of. And so that it's, you know, as much, as much of a, uh, the technical problem has been solved. Um, the, the sort of infrastructure problem is still there and the, and the hearts and minds problem is, uh, you know, this is a term Susan would use a lot is, you know, just getting everybody's awareness, um, for this, um, that, you know, both on the scientific community side and in the responsible engagement with with the, the communities that have been marginalized, that have been minoritized from research, um, that we need to responsibly re-engage. And uh, if we're going to be able to, to rectify this and make discoveries that are going to benefit everyone who needs them. Yeah, I mean, I think you alluded to it. You have your in-house biobank that you're making that's, you know, from induced pluripotent stem cell populations, ideally from diverse you know, diverse populations. And you said that yourself, you know, medical research at its best is, you know, conducted for the benefit of all, right? That's how it should mm -hmm. be. And traditionally, that hasn't always been the case. I mean, you're, you have a genomics background. So you know that, for example, in genome sequencing, the vast majority yeah. of genomes that's been, that have been sequenced out there, as you alluded to, are from European ancestry, 90% plus last time I checked, right? Yeah, the genome project started by sequencing five white guys, right? I mean, and we've we've pretty much continued in that vein since that. Yeah, exactly, and that influences the the drug discovery process. the The whole subsequent downstream is influenced by those upstream key data points, right? So, do you think be, because of just the way, like what we talked about, our field is inherently diverse. Stem cell biology is perhaps a more modern field. We have stem cell biologists everywhere. Do you think our field in general is more poised to tackle some of these questions of biodiversity and specimen biodiversity than, say, we were in the past with, say, genome sequencing? Hmm. Well, that's a 
That's an interesting question. I mean, genomics at the time was also kind of a new field, I'll, I'll say. So I think, you know, there is a, there is a little bit of that. But, you know, I, I like to think so, Aaron. That's a really nice optimistic take on it. I mean, I think there are people with newer ideas in the field. And there's, I think we're a bit more agile as a field than some of the more kind of traditional fields, perhaps. Um, I don't know if I would necessarily call genomics traditional, but like, yeah, maybe I'm, uh, maybe I'm biased as a genomics person. Um, but, you know, certainly I think there's, uh, we, we have that agility and, and we did get, you know, we do see a lot of uptake and support in the stem cell community, especially. And I think, Part of that is also because we realize the incredible opportunity we have here. Like we, you know, we among all fields are so well poised to take this on because we can build these models and and do so at, um, you know, at population scale. So it's, it's a lot harder to do that in, in some of the other um, disciplines or even at the sort of clinical trial level. But like you say, you know, everything you do upstream with these these discoveries, it it radiates through and then biases the entire uh, infrastructure that follows. So um, I hope so. I think that's a very nice, positive um, outlook to, uh, to end on, because I think as you said throughout, there's so much work to do here and you've highlighted it so well, but you've also given us some some really tangible, um, you know, progress to kind of sink our teeth into and also some action items that people can take away just to wrap us up here, Reka, do you have any resources, any key voices, any recommendations, you know, outside of your own that you would like to put out there for the community to to check out, um, you know, to learn a little bit more? You know, we're always looking to learn more. Sorry to put you on the spot. Oh my goodness, um, where do I even start? There's there's a ton out there. Um, you know, I think. Uh, for for simplicity's sake, what I'll say is that we try to write about a lot of these or integrate them into our events. So I I like to think that the NYSEF website, um, uh, nyscf.org, is a uh, is hopefully a good place to to access some of that um, through. You know, we also we have a write up and a video actually of the of the panel discussion that Nicole described, where we link to a lot of um, a lot of the resources that the panelists brought up um, with regards to health equity. Um, we've done similar kinds of events around, um, you know, creating inclusive environments and, uh, you know, going beyond representation to uh, to inclusion and belonging. So I I hope that can be a good simple answer um, for uh, at least as a starting point. But um, yeah, yeah, there's uh, you know I think we all have a lot of education uh, to do and to you know keep ourselves um, informed of what's out there and and. You know, I, I think one thing I want to close on when it comes to resources and self-education is that a lot of a lot of the DEIB work out there is 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 kind of focused or not focused on, but can lead to feelings of sort of guilt and inadequacy um, because it's like, OK, yeah, we all have these implicit biases and we're, you know, we're looking at things with the wrong lens and and it can, you know, that is that is sort of a counterproductive uh, uh, result of looking at looking at DEIB. You know, a lot of us have to take these implicit bias tests for, um, you know, for one thing or another, and inevitably it will tell you that you are biased. We are all biased because we are all products of society, and we we have those things. And that's that's not really the point. The point is is more like what can you do about it, and and what can you do with the knowledge that that's that's there to create something that's actionable, to create something that's constructive, and say. Uh, you know, what can we do to make our environments better, to make the environments better for those those around us? Um, and that's ultimately what I see DIB work as, as being about. Thank you, Rika. Thank you for your knowledge and your time and the work that you're doing and the work that the, the New York Stem Cell Foundation is doing. Um, I'll see you in three months in some way, shape, or form, because <laughs> that's our pattern. We're going I'm to sure. Um, thank you, Arun, for your time and, and contributions. And uh, take care, everyone. Thank you so much. This was really, really fun to talk with you guys. And uh, yeah, thank you for, for taking the time to spotlight this uh, these issues. I really appreciate it. That brings us to the end of our show. Don't forget to sign up for our email list at www.labcoatsandlifepodcast.com to get show notes, episode summaries, and links to useful information. Or learn more about STEM mentorship via the resources found at www.stemcell.com slash labcoatsandlife. 
You can also reach out to us on X through Stem Cell at Stem Cell Tech or by email at info at labcoatsandlifepodcast.com with feedback or to suggest guests.